everyone. Welcome, welcome to my talk. So I'm Jen, Jennifer, and I know all of you guys, so it's fantastic, and thank you for coming out. Um, this uh, has been so wonderful to have the opportunity to do this post-trip talk, because so often we get to do um, something really exciting, and then you just get on with life, and you don't have time to process it. So it's been wonderful um, to be prodded into processing all of this and culling everything down. I'm really, really grateful to the IPCCR, so that's the grant, the um, organization through which I won the grant to go on this trip. I'm really grateful to Frank for everything he's done in creating the IPCCR. So international programs. For creative collaboration and research. For creative collaboration and research. Um, hi, Adrian, thank you for coming. So I had uh, three goals when I wrote this grant proposal. Um, so one goal was to go to Ireland to research a new play that I want to write about my dad's immigration, emigration from Ireland. He emigrated when he was eight. He was born in Dublin. He came over on a boat with his mother and his three younger sisters, his oldest brother, and his dad had gone ahead to Canada and then immigrated to the U.S. So I've been hearing, of course, stories for a long time. I went to Ireland once a long time ago and have forgotten a lot about it um, and have not been great about really paying attention to my dad's stories. And so now I have this renewed interest in uh, looking at that immigration experience and then also um, somehow comparing, contrasting it to our current immigration uh, situation here in the US, which is very fraught, right? And everything that's going on at the border. Um, so that was one objective, to go to Ireland, be there in Dublin, where I imagine my play is going to set, soak things up, and then do lots of specific research about the city and about my family's heritage as well. The second goal was to make international relationships that could um, uh, pave the way for future collaborations. And so that's with folks in London and in Dublin. And then my third goal was to bring those relationships back here to you guys. So I was able to accomplish all three of those goals. I'm going to tell you more details about those as we go. Um, so let's start with my list. I made this list as I was crossing back across the Atlantic. Um, and, and, and processing the trip and everything that I had gotten from it, it was so much and I was so full every single day. So the flight back was the first time that I had the time to really simmer on and see um, what I had gained from this trip. So, so you see on the left there are little images of the different theaters that I went to and the different play productions that I saw. Uh, so I got to see eight play productions in nine days. So it was a wild ride. It was a thrilling ride. And six of them were outstanding and inspired me in some way or another, which is a really good hit ratio. <laughs> really. Um, so I'll be talking about those more specifically. Um, but first, to my list here. I'm titling this the top seven principles that seem to me at this point to be essential <laughs> to making powerful theater. Okay, so the first one, get creative distance. So I had the opportunity to go to two other countries. So that was fantastic. That's an immense way to get creative distance. It's not the only way to get creative distance. Um, but having that opportunity to really bust out of my comfort zone, bust out of everything that I know on a day-to-day -day basis, and really ingest a new country and a new community was incredibly inspiring every single day. And it didn't matter whether I was seeing a play or having a networking meeting or just figuring out how to walk from Blackfriars Bridge to Charing Cross, right? All of that was inspiring because all of it was new, and so it was feeding me, and I was noticing everything fresh, you know, that feeling where you suddenly start noticing the leaves on the trees instead of just the blur of your everyday commute and the things that you do all the time. So something that I want to uh, pass on as an idea to all of you is the idea of seeking that out. How do you find your own creative distance on a day-to-day -day basis? 
So that could be doing something new, somehow busting out of your comfort zone. So I would argue that it could be as simple as picking a different way to walk from your dorm to where you have class. Right? It could be um, going to a different website in the morning. It could be listening to a podcast that you think, I would never ever be interested in this topic, or music, or asking somebody else for inspiration. It could be something quieter, I think, right? Just sitting and touching base with yourself. I think if it is anything that is other than your regular daily routine, then it is something that you will notice, and it is something that will spark you in some way. Uh, and then, I would argue, write down those sparks, right? Any inspiration you have, write it down. That's what I do. I always have one of these journals with me at all times, and I write everything down because otherwise it absolutely falls out of my head. All right. My next point is that the best theater builds community. So that's something that I think that um, the London theater scene and the Dublin theater scene are particularly good at, and I think that we could do better in our country. And so that can be as simple as having a bar and a restaurant on site at the theater, and not just open beforehand, but also open afterwards. Uh, and I, that's quite rare here. I don't know of many examples that happen here in our country. Um, and, you know, it sounds frivolous, like, oh, you get to have a drink, but it's more than that. So, for example, I went to the Young Vic, which is a great theater in London. They do a lot of new work. Uh, and I went in there, and it's a really compressed, cramped space, and there was just so much hunger and energy, and the whole place was packed, and people were waiting in line for their tickets, and people were at the restaurant, and I think some people were at the restaurant who weren't even seeing the play, because it was also a good restaurant, and then some people were at the bar, and so there's just this buzz and this energy before the show that just, frankly, made it feel like a really exciting place to be. Not like a dull, okay, I have to go like, take my theater vitamin and go see the show, um, and it, it kind of feeling like work, which I think it does sometimes, right? We all sometimes have to see shows, so it can feel like that. But it felt so fun and vibrant, it felt like an event. And then to have it open afterwards, I think is really key, because then you're not just walking out of the theater and saying, okay, I did that, done, okay, let's go somewhere else, and then often not even talking about the play afterwards. Hopefully you've seen a play that is so exciting and has so many open-ended questions that you really want to talk about it with the people who you're there with or meet other people and talk about it. Um, so, for example, at when I saw uh, Come From Away, which is a musical right, that is touring a lot around the world right now, and I saw that at the Abbey Theatre, which is the National Theatre of Ireland, um, so that's in Dublin. I saw Come From Away, and the energy was so palpable in the house. It was the closing performance of the Dublin run, so that might have added to the, just the hunger and the fever. People were so thrilled to be there, and just standing up, standing ovation, and then everyone turned around and filed up all the way up the stairs um, to the upper exit, which led right out into the bar, and it felt like the vast majority of the audience just stayed and just didn't want to leave the space. And so I think there's something just really valuable about that, even if you don't know what to say after you see a play that's really powerful, just to stay in that space and not have to break the spell, the magic of what you've just been through, and to just be there with the people who you've come with. And then, about a half an hour later, the cast came out. And the cast had to come out through the bar uh, from their dressing rooms. And uh, immediately, they started mingling with the audience. And I don't know that I've ever seen that before. So for there to be that um, breakdown of a sense of hierarchy between we are the actors, and you probably don't know anything about theater, and I'm not going to talk to you, and I'm up on this pedestal. But just to, you know, yeah, let's share a kind of give us together. And immediately I started talking to one and was asking him about the process and where the cast was from and how they were transferring to London next. And I had a really great conversation and I saw that happening uh, around the whole lobby. Uh, so I think that I want to put that forward as an idea for you guys, you the next generation of theater makers. It's an idea for what we can do to make theater fun and to make it more instilled as part of our community. The idea of lingering and co-mingling. 
Okay, number three. Everyone will know if you lie, if you BS, if you skim the surface, if you phone it in, right? So we've all seen productions where that's happened, right? The productions that are soulless. There's a lot of them out there, right? And, you know, really, it's probably the vast majority of theater is not brilliant, right? And so that's why you have to keep going to find the really brilliant stuff. So, okay, so I mentioned that I saw two plays that were really stinkers, so I want to tell you about them. Um, so, um, let's see. Uh, the first one was I'm Not Running, which is David Hare's new play, and that was at the National Theater. Um, and what I saw there is just a real lack of honesty in the script, for one thing. It just didn't make sense, the emotional journeys that the characters were going through. Um, now granted, a lot of the audience seemed engaged, right? And I might have been in the minority in this, but then also you have to look at audience demographics too. I think it was an older, white, wealthier audience, which is a, a trend in theater, right? Across our country as well, in regional theater. Um, and the, uh, so that was the script. And then the acting also did not make sense, was not authentic. It was sort of posing, it, and it was definitely phoning it in, and all of it was skimming the surface. So for some people that was satisfying, but I would argue and would challenge you, and you probably feel the same way, but it's not worth our time, right? And so my argument is give everything of yourself. And that's tough, right? That's a lot easier to say than to actually do, but to really rip open those guts, get your viscera on the page, get your viscera on the stage, whatever your collaborative role is, put it all out there. And that can be terrifying, right? So if you are truly making yourself vulnerable, it's really terrifying. But that's what's going to make rewarding theater. And it's going to feel good to you, it's going to feel good to your collaborators, and your audience will notice that as well. So the other plays that I saw really, really demonstrated that. But first, let me tell you about the other stinker. Um, the other one was uh, The Cane by Mark Ravenhill at Royal Court. And I was so excited to go to Royal Court Theater as one of the leaders in the world of new plays. And so I'm excited to see something good there. Um, but the same thing, I felt like this play in particular was um, very sensationalistic just for the sake of sensationalism. Um, again, did not make sense what was going on with the arc and the journey of the characters. Um, uh, so I, I think my issue is mainly with the script with that one. I think the actors tried their best. But, okay, going on to the ones that I thought really were strong and really were vulnerable. So The Convert by Denai Guerrero. So oh. probably a lot of you know who Denai Guerrero is, right? <laughs> She's an incredibly <laughs> successful actress and an incredibly successful playwright at mm -hmm. the same time. Um, and so her, it's one of her newest plays, The Convert, and it uh, was at the Young Vic, the one I mentioned, that had the really buzzing lobby and restaurant and bar. Um, and there was so much commitment in there. Um, and it was also really exciting because it was in the round. And that's really thrilling too, right? If it's done right, to have that in the round as opposed to the proscenium separation. Um, but everyone was to the hilt committed to what they were doing. Um, I felt the same way about Sweat. So a lot of you know Sweat. Those, those of you in my playwriting class were about to discuss it in class. right? So this is Lynn Nottage's play um, that was just on Broadway. Um, and so there was a production of the Dunmar Warehouse. So the Dunmar Warehouse is one of my three favorite theaters in the entire world. So every time I go to London, I go straight to the Dunmar Warehouse, even if I'm not seeing a play. So the, the very first day I was there, I just had to walk by the Dunmar Warehouse. It's one of those places that I just want to be in its orbit. Um, and they, Martha Plimpton uh, played the lead. Um, and so she's the only American actress who was in it. All the others were English, but it's a really, really American play. Um, and let me tell you about this one really thrilling moment Thrilling moment in the play is uh, the play starts out, who knows the script, all right, okay, great. So the play starts out um, in sort of the penultimate moment of the story chronologically, and it's a very small scene between two people in a little office. 
So it's a little small conversation and it's a little disorienting. You don't know what they're talking about exactly. There's some sort of conflict. They're talking about something in the past. You don't know what's going on. Then we leap back into the past and how they did that in this production is suddenly there was tons of music and everybody else just poured on stage and like the lights were up and we suddenly launch into going back into the bar. There's a bar that is the, the primary setting of the play. The entire bar, everything for the bar was up above in the fly space, but you could see it. And so as the actors were pouring on stage, laughing, giggling, drunk, raucous, joking, singing, the whole bar descended down and then the actors put all the stools in place so they were part of the transformation. Um, and that's something that we've talked a bit about, a little bit in viewpoints, and a little bit in um, my playwriting class as well, is those really thrilling transitional moments. Um, and those have been some of the moments that have stuck with me the most out of the best productions that I've ever seen. So that one really stuck with me. And all the way through to the hill performances and really vulnerable. Um, I also saw, um, so I went to the Victoria and Albert Blythe Archive. So does anyone besides Drew know what that is? Okay, so Drew and I, we found out through Facebook, were in London at the same time and were at this particular archive just a day apart from each other. <laughs> um, and we ended up, out of all the videos on archive, we ended up seeing the same play. Um, so I saw Jerusalem by Jez Butterworth. So Jez Butterworth, who knows about Jez Butterworth? Okay, right. So yeah, and I mentioned him in playwriting class. He is one of my all-time favorite playwrights. He wrote Mojo, which has been one of the most impactful plays to me. He wrote The Ferryman, which is on Broadway now. And then what I missed, and what I kept kicking myself over, is that I missed his 2009 production called Jerusalem, which is what really exploded him and what most people knew him for. And it started at the Royal Court, and then it moved to the West End, and then it moved to Broadway. And I missed all of that. But there is one place in the entire world where you can go watch a recording of this. So good for everybody to know about the Victorian Albert Museum's Blythe House Archive, B-L-Y-T-H-E. Um, and it is a place that is modeled on the Lincoln Center Archive. So also good for you to remember Lincoln Center as a source for archival. All those productions that you hear about that seem legendary, that you're kicking yourself, that you weren't alive for or you missed, there are opportunities to see many of these plays. Um, so that, I encourage you to check him out, check out these plays as well, um, but that also went completely to the hilt, right? The, nothing conservative, nothing held back. Um, I also saw uh, Hades Town. I was playing some music as we were gathering uh, at the National, and while we're talking about it, I'm gonna play you um, this one song, just a little section from this one song. So this um, musical, um, Anais, Nish, I mean, Anais Mitchell started writing this, I think, 10 years ago, she said. Uh, but you'll notice that this one particular song is very um, present to today. Um, and 
Okay, well, we'll speak a little bit more about that play as I get to later points. Let's go to number four. Be hungry to learn and reach out and be international in scope. So I've always considered myself hungry to learn, trying to gather uh, information. However, I have often forgotten to think beyond our own borders of our country, right? It can be very easy to start getting insular here, even though I have traveled a lot, right? I haven't traveled as much recently. Um, and so it gets easy to forget how much there is beyond our country and that there's a lot of else going on in the world that is important, right? So to reach out for that, of course, in every way, news and then also creatively, what are other artists doing in other parts of the world? And you, the next thing that I want to do is reach out beyond the English speaking world as well, um, to not be limited that way. Uh, the other thing that I feel like I've been obstructed by is just time. And so what I've started doing lately is multitasking. And so I've discovered these podcasts. I'm gonna get to a list of podcasts that I'll show you at the end. Uh, and I've told my playwrights about these. But uh, I listen to them every single time I commute now and oftentimes when I work out. And so I am constantly just ingesting inspiration. And some of these podcasts are London-based podcasts uh, and so I'm continuing to try to think internationally and then, like I said, I want to keep going farther than that as well. Um, so I encourage you to reach out. What the inspiration that you find, of course, doesn't have to be theater. Right? Go to all these amazing museums that we have here. Reach out, talk to other people. And this, of course, overlaps with the, the first point of going outside your comfort zone. Uh, point five, champion other theater artists. Don't be a snob, and there's no reason to be competitive, right? So I think this is something that we can all remind ourselves of, because we're all trying so hard, right? And we all want this so, so badly. But I would argue the best way for us to do this is to lift each other up. And we're not fighting for the same little pot. We really aren't. We will each find our own paths that's right to us. We are each individual artists. So let's help each other. And so I encourage you, when something great happens for somebody else, consider that a win for everybody, right? And then and tout them, champion them, spread the word about what they're doing. And then that way, we will build this community. Um, there's no point in us, in us tearing each other down. And there's no point in us pretending like being theater artists is so cool that we need to be snotty, right? <laughs> uh, all right, six, keep filling your creative well. Be proactive, seek out inspiration, multitask, right? So this, again, overlaps with the other about seeking out those museums, those podcasts as well, and going to see plays, going to see as many plays as you can, and everything else, right? Concerts, find poetry, find articles that light you on fire or that you crack open new ways of thinking for you. And then seven, and this is something that I have believed for a long time and it's really central to my work, is right beyond what you know. So there's the old adage of write what you know. Yes, I think that's important. And I think everything that you write or create should be personal, should be connected to you personally. But that doesn't mean that you're limited by your own individual demographic or specific experience, right? Uh, think of all the stories that would not have been written, right? every Shakespeare play, right? Everything that would not have been written uh, if people stuck to just what they know. However, then if you're writing beyond what you know, particularly if you're writing about another culture, I think it's essential that you do the research, right? Lots of research, first person research, and be really humble to that research and really listen. Um, because if you're going to be representing people who are beyond your own experience, that can get tricky as well. Right, um, and so you want to be aware of um, of cultural appropriation, right? And so I think there, there's a fine line that there's a lot of debate nationwide in the theater about how to approach that. Um, but my feeling is that that is how we build an empathetic bridge. So when I write, when I do research about an experience beyond my own, I gain empathy for people who've gone through that experience. And then when I communicate that to my collaborators, they gain empathy. And then when we can communicate that in production to our audience, we all gain empathy by reaching outside of our own experience. All right, those were my seven. 
Um, so here's a recommended uh, reading and podcast. Well, first, so th there's the list of the plays that I saw in London. I mentioned all of those. And then the plays that I saw in Dublin. So I mentioned Come From Away. And I want to tell you about The Great Gatsby. So speaking of community, building community and reaching out, the Great Gatsby was a promenade immersive adaptation. So who knows what promenade means? Who wants to tell me? Jocelyn, what does promenade mean? Uh, there's not necessarily audience seating. They can move around and the actors move around them as well. Indeed, yes. And what's immersive? Yeah, Miranda. You're in it. You're right? in it, totally. Yes, exactly. Like this. Yeah. And that was completely true for The Great Gatsby. So it was a new adaptation. And this was done by the Gate Theater in Dublin. This is a remount. They had a really successful run of it before. Um, and, but we were, uh, we arrived there, and the entire audience was dressed up in 1920s attire. And I had no idea that was even an option. I had missed that on the website. <laughs> but um, I was probably one of five people who were not dressed up in 1920s attire out of an audience of maybe 200. Ooh. So it was wild. And then they had this you know, sort of speakeasy <clears throat> prohibition era bar that you mingled around before the show. And then um, during the show, you uh, were invited by an actor to follow them into a room. And so there was this constant, like, you were on your toes because you really wanted to be invited into the best room, whatever that meant. And so you were constantly looking around and going, oh, those actors are running away over there. And sometimes you could just run and join into that group, even if you weren't invited. Um, and then sometimes you stayed in this main uh, ballroom. And uh, at one point, I got to do um, a flapper dance lesson as part of the play as well. So, so much community. Also, in the beginning, you didn't know who was the actor and who was the audience member uh, because everyone was dressed the same. And the audience's costumes were outstanding, so they really were on par with the actors' costumes. Um, so that was an absolutely thrilling and really uh, unique experience. Uh, so here, um, the podcast that I recommend, and I will be curious to hear if anyone else has podcast recommendations, but the subtext from American Theater, uh, based in Chicago, and it's lots of um, interviews with playwrights. Royal Court Playwrights Podcast also interviews with playwrights um, in London, and then the National Theater NT Talks, and all of these I have found to be outstanding and incredibly inspirational, particularly from a playwriting perspective. And then here are um, some playwrights and plays uh, that I was turned on to through my uh, meetings. Um, so the folks that I met with are Selena Cartmel, so she's the artistic director of the Gate Theater, so that's the theater that did The Great Gatsby. Um, I met with Annabel Komen, so she is the artistic director of Hatch Theater Company, and she's also a freelance director. Um, and in terms of setting up future collaborations, um, she's interested in um, talking with me, reading this new Irish play, or potentially Yellowstone, another new play of mine, um, and is interested in potentially coming here at some point to workshop one of the plays. So that's another hope of mine for a next step, further iteration, is to introduce you guys to her as well. Um, and then uh, Jesse Weaver is the literary director of the Abbey Theater, and so I got to talk with him. Uh, at great length, there's a lot of controversy over Come From Away being produced at the Abbey since it is the National Theater of Ireland. And um, Come From Away is not about the Irish experience at all. Uh, and it was an entirely English cast that was imported and doing a touring production. So it was not uh, an Irish produced play at all. Um, so that's the controversy that I really understand. Uh, so it was interesting in each of my meetings to sort of talk through that. And um, then I also met with Jim Culleton, who's the artistic director of Fish Amble Theater Company. And you all are invited to come meet them. So I had originally intended on using one of these classrooms to do um, an, an international video Skype session with him. But he's in town. He's directing a show called Silent, which is at Atlas Theater, which is about to open next weekend. Um, and I can also give you a discount code for that. So just email me if you want a discount code, or one of the playwrights in my class can share that with you. Um, and so he's going to be in town just at the same time as my play advanced playwriting class. And he was interested in coming in as a guest artist. So uh, that is happening this coming Tuesday 
from 10 a.m. until 11.50 a.m. and we meet in the dance conference room. So if you're interested in coming to that, let me know. I just wanna make sure if you need to move to a bigger room that we do that, but you're welcome to come to that and learn more about Irish theater through camp. So I'm so excited that this is the, the first step in me um, being able to directly introduce you guys to someone there. Um, so let me just real quick show you these photos. So. In the spirit of getting to research um, my dad's Irish immigration, my dad got to join me on this trip, and this is my dad. Uh, so like I said, he was born in Dublin, he left at age eight, and he is also very conveniently the keeper of all the stories and all the family trees, and it's probably driven him crazy, I have not paid attention, I have not cared, until now, and I do. Um, and so now, you know, I have a very direct reason, and I'm very curious, and so I'm, I finally carefully listened to all these stories, and so I was constantly getting family stories as we went, he was showing me the family tree, I was finally understanding things. We went and we found the building where my great-great-grandfather worked in a tailor shop, and he met my great-great-grandmother because he used to go across the street, and then we saw that building where he had lunch at the restaurant where my great-great-grandmother worked. Um, so that was exciting. So my dad is very cute. There he is. And he was very excited after seeing Gatsby. Um, this is me in front of the National Theater. I took a picture in front of each of the theaters I went to. Yeah. This is me in front of the Royal Court, and that is my, I'm very pissed off at having seen a, a horribly mediocre play. <laughs> but I'm trying um, to be happy. But this is right after I went on a, a just a huge rant. My dad liked the play, though. Um, this is so... Um, so a wonderful Frank here is part of, key part of designing the globe uh, in London, right? So recreation of Shakespeare's globe. And I'd been there before, I'd seen a production there, and um, I got to go back and go for a tour there. So like I said, a lot of the trip was just about ingesting the cities and the city's history and literary history. This is the Young Vic that I mentioned, where Young, the Convert by Denai Guerrero is playing. This is the Dunmar, that's my, I can't believe I'm at the Dunmar glow on my face. <laughs> um, this is the um, courtyard of the Victorian Albert Blythe House uh, archive, where I hope you will all go yeah, somewhere. Really that's an artifact from the British Museum because they share the building, but both of the British Museum storage and the V&A stuff will be moving within the next couple of years across town. So the Blythe Houses, which is what the structure, the huge building is called, it's actually going to be moving. Um, so if you have designs to go, check in with me or um, the website, and it'll let you know. Ooh, very exciting. And That's everybody does crazy. know that you can see recordings of Washington productions here in this library, right, at the La Palma Collection. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, that's what a great resource we have right here in our building. Um, and so if you want to, to visit the V&A archive, just so you know, you have to plan ahead at least a few days, ideally a week. You have to email them, you have to apply for a library card. Uh, it's actually not that difficult, but there, there's a little process to go through. <laughs> there's, a, there's a gate that you have to get buzzed in, and it's a little formal. This is the Abbey Theater in Dublin. Um, this is back at the Gate Theater. This is inside um, Gatsby, so we were allowed to take um, pictures as soon as the production was over, but this was the ballroom. Uh, that was the central room where Gatsby took place, and then we ran out into different side rooms. Um, this is Oscar Wilde, um, and uh, part of the uh, self-guided literary tour that I did of Dublin, and that's everything. Um, Thank you for coming. Does anyone have time for maybe one or two questions? Quick questions? Just another point of information as they're talking about or thinking about questions. We have copies of um, The Convert, a copy of Jerusalem, and a copy of Sweat, this place that she saw. Just so if, if, you, so if you're interested in those three places, we do have those. And I think we're getting come from away somehow. Great. I Thank you. And probably all the other ones they can get through in our library alone. And that's true, too. Um, yeah. Most of those are not that good. Right? Mm -hmm. okay. um, if you want copies of any of these lists, and if you have any questions, just email me. You all have my email, but it's jbarclay at umd.edu. I unfortunately have to run really fast so I can pick up my kids on time, but thank you so much for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.